Xander mentioned it a couple times, but I noticed that it's not on the main slide, that um, FOFM stands for the First Order Fire Effects Model, and this overview was developed for version 5, so that's why it says FOFM 5 on there. Um, just as background, we're currently working on the sixth version of FOFM. So there are some things that we want to update in the model, and I'll go over some of those things as I um, walk through this presentation. My um, plan is to do first a, a PowerPoint presentation that's just going to give this overview of FOFM. Then I'm going to do a live demo from my computer to show a little bit how things work. And then um, if there's time, I might follow up with some, uh, some other material, just a couple of other studies. So first of all, FOFM 5 is a computer system to calculate the first order fire effects from simple inputs. So relatively simple inputs, you don't need a lot of information to make FOFM 5 work. Um, it's a Windows program that sits on your desktop, so it's not a web application. We did have a web application for a while that wasn't used a lot, so we've taken that down and we can re-examine that in the future if we need to. Um, it has, so FOFM has a graphical user interface. Um, it also has a batch mode, which is really nice if you're running, uh, you want to get fire effects simulations for a number of plots. You can run that batch mode from the command line in a DOS window or from right within the, the FOFM interface. FOFM is the fire effects calculator that's um, integrated into the Wildland Fire Assessment Tool. The Wildland Fire Assessment Tool is essentially a spatialized version of FOFM with some fire behavior in it. So the idea is that you can look not just at point-based estimates of fire effects like you do in FOFM, but with, with WIFIT you can look at those fire effects across the landscape. And the whole reason that I'm giving this presentation today is because next month uh, the WIFIT presentation will be presented, and this just provides a lot of background for uh, how WIFIT is, is working. As I said, um, FOFM is the first order fire effects model, and first order fire effects are the immediate consequences of fire, whether direct or indirect. And in the case of FOFM, that's true most of the time. There's one instance where um, what we're presenting is not an immediate effect, and that's with tree mortality. And those typically are represented um, from studies that were two or three years old. So just keep that in mind, and I'll mention it again when, we, when I get to um, the mortality section of FOFM. FOFM uh, predicts effects really with three major ways. The, the first one is a mechanistic model, and that's used primarily for simulating the woody fuel consumption. And what's nice is that this, uh, this mechanistic model also gives us the duration of the burn. We also include empirical equations that come from research studies, published uh, articles. And then we also have this heuristic information to bridge the gaps and just to, to select the best data and equations for predicting fire effects. We also include in FOFM an extensive set of default inputs, which is really nice for users that may not have all the information that's needed to run FOFM. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to see you know, folks that are able to input all the fuels data that is needed to run FOFM, but that's just not the reality. And so if they have partial fuels or partial data set, they can use these default fuel beds to kind of get them started and then plug in their own data where they have it. It applies in most U.S. forest types, some rangeland types, and of course in all areas uh, across the United States. It doesn't matter who manages them. It is, I would say as an aside, it's an approved software in all of the major uh, land management agencies. It's useful for conducting uh, environmental assessments. So for instance, before a burn, I'm looking at maybe what emissions might be from a prescribed fire. You can use it for developing fire and silvicultural prescriptions. Let's say that you might have some, some concern about um, reducing fine woody fuels while maintaining coarse woody debris, uh, maintaining dust, that kind of thing. And then also it's useful for uh, assessing fire severity or burn severity. And this is kind of in a general sense when, when I talk about the tree mortality and uh, the soil heating. That's what sort of relate to the burn severity um, assessments that we make in FOFM. FOFM really has four major effects that we're uh, simulating. One is the fuel consumption. Next would be the smoke production, which of course is 
tightly related to the fuel consumption. Then we have tree mortality, which is kind of its own thing. I'll go about or talk about that more in a little bit. And then the soil heating. So just to talk in depth a little bit more about each part here, the fuel consumption component, um, Folfen predicts the consumption of duff and litter, the surface and woody fuels by the size class, and the live and canopy fuels. Um, Folfen uses the burn-up model, which is a mechanistic model for predicting the woody fuel consumption. And what's nice about using burn-up is that it's, um, you're not just looking at a, a a pre-fire condition and a post-fire condition, a before and after. Burnup actually works on a time step, so you can see what's happening um, between ignition and when combustion ends. We do live and uh, sorry, duff and live fuel consumption, predicting rules and regression equations. So these regression equations here are really empirical equations that come from research studies, and we can kind of direct the user or the user selects cover type, region, moisture, and season to direct FOFM to pick the, the best relationships for the simulation. Burnup predicts the woody fuel consumption by um, simulating the heat transfer between the fuel particles. And the, the whole underlying idea of burnup is that it's this uh, adjacency of pieces and the interaction of combustion of these pieces that are of woody fuel that are close by each other. And those are the major physical processes that's uh, leading to the consumption of fuels. We can predict a consumption rate or combustion rate with burnup because it's running on a time step. And we can also predict a fire intensity at each one of those time steps, which is really useful because we can use that information to um, derive emissions rate over time, uh, soil heating, and that kind of thing. The inputs needed for the fuel consumption are fuel load by size class and fuel moisture. And we'll, we provide outputs for uh, fuel consumption by size class and then the post-burn fuel load. And then there are a number of other uh, reports that I'll show you when I do the live demo. The second major effect that FOFM simulates is the smoke production. Because we are running burn up, we have a rate of, of consumption of fuels, which is tightly related, of course, to the emissions that are coming from those fires. We can calculate an emission production rate and then the fire intensity over the whole period of the, of the burning time, the combustion is occurring for the surface fires. We simulate the flaming and smoldering combustion, and each one of those has its own emissions factor um, and, and combustion efficient. Uh, efficiency. So what's nice again about burnup is that we're, you know, the flaming and the smoldering can happen at the same time and we can model that with, within FOFM. You get estimate, estimates for uh, all the different components of smoke for the particulate matter, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, so on. We use these uh, published emissions factors to estimate the smoke production. We have separate emissions factors for the flaming and for the smoldering, uh, which both can occur simultaneously, as I said. And then the emissions production, is have, is we can show a graph of that over time. We can produce a table of that over time um, from when ignition starts until the combustion ceases. The inputs needed are the same things for fuel consumption because it's, they're so tightly related fuel load by size class and the fuel moisture. And then we'll pr produce the uh, smoke production rate for all of the uh, components of the smoke over time and then the overall combustion efficiency. The third major effect that we simulate in FOFM is tree mortality. And at first look, this pre-fire and post-fire mortality doesn't make a lot of sense. So I'll explain it a little bit. Pre-fire is if you're planning something, you're going to have a fire, and you might know uh, basically what the fuel moistures are and what your flame heights are and that kind of thing. You can sort of, uh, you can use FOFM to look at the potential mortality in those stands pre-fire, so before it actually happens. The post-fire mortality equations, from the people that use them say um, 
they tend to work a bit better, is when you go in after a fire and you're actually making assessments on those trees uh, that are a little bit different than the pre-fire assessment. And so you can improve your mortality prediction by using those post-fire post equations. The mortality is predicted by species and size, and by size here, it's really dBH, which is related to bark thickness. Um, the slide says that we predict mortality for 207 tree species, and that gives me a, a little bit of uh, heartburn because really there are only about 30 equations uh, in, in FOFM for mortality. And what we, what we do um, is, so for species that we don't have mortality equations for, we just assign those species that, to something that's similar. For instance, if we have a lodgepole pine equation, then maybe we can use that for jack pine. If we have a Jeffrey pine equation, then we can use that for ponderosa pine. And that works pretty well most of the time. Uh, but we also are, end up we're predicting mortality of hardwood species with conifer equations. And that's a bit of a problem. Also, there are some species uh, in the southeast, like longleaf pine, that are pretty bulletproof to fire. And I've heard from more than one person that FOFM will predict 80% mortality of longleaf pine, and yet they don't see any mortality in their stand. So, this is the first thing I'll talk about with uh, the next version of Fulfman in version six. I really, um, I think we all want to examine these mortality equations, find new ones where we can, uh, maybe limit the equations that are actually being used or the species that are being um, used, or we'll do what we do now, is which we provide an actual estimate of mortality, um, but in version six, maybe put a big asterisk next to it that says that this tree species, this hardwood species, for instance, mortality was predict predicted using um, an equation from a conifer species, and it might not be worthwhile. Because FOFM is the first order of fire effects model, not a fire behavior model, the user has to enter a uh, flame height or scorch height for tree mortality. And that's because it's, uh, the scorch height is what's it's one of the two predictors used to predict tree mortality. Um, sorry, I had a little glitch on my end here, but I think we're okay now. So mortality is predicted from the bark thickness and the crown scorch, and of course bark thickness is related to the uh, dBH of the tree. Crown scorch has to be input by the user. The species influences uh, for mortality are only through the bark thickness. So that's the only thing, the only species factor that we use to predict mortality of, uh, of the trees. And then the user inputs the crown scorch, and those two factors together are used to predict the mortality. Um, and the Fulfins mortality algorithms, they've been found to work pretty well uh, in western conifers anyway. And like I said, in the southeast, they might not work so well. Oak hickory forest, they're probably not going to work so well. So those are improvements that we want to make in version six. The mortality equations also don't account for the season of the burn or uh, differences in the burn duration, or uh, they only indirectly account for the post-burn insect attack. So going back to the to the beginning of how these mortality equations were developed, you know, it was a directly post-fire assessment of these trees. Um, and then they went and sampled a number of things, went back and looked at them two years later, and, and then just determined what the mortality was for those trees over that two-year period. So not an immediate effect. And we don't know what the season of the burn was. We don't know what the burn duration was and all that. It was just a post-fire assessment. So tree mortality in Fulfum is really, it's kind of untied from the other three components. We don't use burn up. Um, for the tree mortality, we conceivably could for, you know, use it for fire intensity and then stem heating and soil heating and all that, and that's something that we'll look at in the future. But right now, tree mortality is kind of its own thing. The inputs needed for the pre-fire are kind of the general information that you would collect for tree data anyway, species, dBH, height, crown ratio, um, those kinds of things, and then the fire intensity that the user inputs. If you're looking at post-fire, it's assessment, it's pretty much the same information, except there's this cambium kill rating that uh, you sample on each tree, you divide the, the bowl into quadrants, and you sample the, the cambium each one of those quadrants to assess whether, whether or not it's, uh, that cambium is alive. And then in some species, the beetle attack is important also, a, a significant factor in the mortality. 
As I said before, the post-fire equations tend to work better than the pre-fire from what I've heard. The outputs, we generate the probability of mortality for every tree in every size class and a post-fire stand table. The fourth effect that we do in FOFM is the soil heating. We model uh, temperature at different depths over time. So for every one centimeter in the soil, beginning at the soil surface, which is right below the duff, and then every centimeter down, I believe, to 12 centimeters, we can predict uh, what the time or what the temperature is over the whole duration of the of the burn. Duff plays a uh, an important role in determining soil heating, and so there are a couple models in FOFM. One is the Duff model. If Duff is there um, and remains after a burn, then it provides a pretty good insulator for the soil, even if there's not a lot of Duff. And so we don't get much soil heating. If duff moisture is high, for instance, or if the intensity of the above or the surface fuels is not enough to drive the moisture off out of the duff and consume the duff, duff remains that insulator and limits the soil heating. If the duff starts to get consumed, so the moisture is below 40% or so, then duff is its own heat source and it, the burning of itself heats the soil. If there's no duff layer present, then all of the heat that's driven into the soil in Fulfum comes from the surface, the surface fire and the intensity that's essentially coming out of burnout. One thing that we want to look at in version 6 is that there's some complex interaction here. For instance, um, the current equations when we have deep duff, it doesn't ever burn all of the duff in a fire regardless of what the moisture is. And so we, we need to revisit that. In fact, it's already been revisited. We, the, the code has already been incorporated into testing versions. So we're modifying FOFM some uh, just to improve some of the, the predictions that we're making in FOFM. And uh, version 6 will include some of that. It will also include, we're, we're looking at this question about when FOFM is present at the beginning of a burn and then it's all consumed and then you have the surface fire intensity above that's still contributing soil heating. Right now, Fulfum doesn't handle that situation very well, so we're looking at improving that too in version 6. Inputs needed are the fuel sizes, the moisture, and for the soil heating, we also need a soil texture and a moisture content of, uh, of the soil. Outputs generated, the soil temperature at those depths, those one centimeter depths over the duration of the fire, We'll also uh, produce a report that shows the depth to the, or the deepest depth that reached 60 degrees Celsius, which is typically the, temp the temperature people think that uh, living tissue is destroyed or dies, and then 275 degrees Celsius, is where we kind of see changes in uh, soil characteristics and that kind of thing. So the strengths of Fulfum are that it's, it's relatively simple. It's easy to learn and use. It, uh, when you install Fulfum, it's just a real easy install package. Everything you do is on one screen. You're not switching back, back and forth between different screens. The reports and everything come right out on the same screen. You'll see that in a minute. Um, it can be used for a variety of purposes, as I said at the beginning, whether it's planning for emissions or you know, fuel consumption or tree mortality, whatever you're looking at. Uh, it can be used for those kinds of things. It accommodates a variable level of, of input detail, and this is on the manager's end, but if they don't have any information, any fuels information, they can use one of the default fuel beds that, that are in FOFM. Maybe they have some of that information. They can pick a default fuel bed in FOFM that's similar to um, what they have and then input their own data where they have it, or they can just input all of their own data if they want to do that. And we have this heuristic information that helps uh, bridge the research gaps, um, sort of guesses and that kinds of things on how things react when we don't really have uh, published studies to back up some of the decisions we make. And it also helps us uh, get around, you know, there's just an infinite variety of variables involved in determining fire effects. And so this, the approach that we use in FOFM helps get around uh, some of the complexities of that. Collaboration, I just always like to 
you know, talk about the people that have been involved, if only so people don't think this is something I came up with last week. Um, the fuel consumption, Al, Frank Albini was the guy who wrote the, the burn-up model um, and really did a lot of work on determining a large fuel burnout in prescribed fires and that kind of thing. Mark Finney reprogrammed burnout so that it could be incorporated in things like Farsight, but also so that we could incorporate it into um, FOFM. And they looked at this, uh, the difference between the, the flaming combustion and the smoldering combustion and how to incorporate those kinds of things into, into FOFM. Smoke production was put together, that module was put together by Ann Atchison and Mark Schaff. Soil heating, a lot of the basic work was done by Roger Hungerford and then Dan Jimenez and Jim Reardon looked at Roger's work uh, and incorporated that into FOFM, specifically into FOFM 5. Then acknowledgments, um, Jim Brown, Fulfum was really his idea. When Jim retired, uh, it was kind of taken over by Elizabeth Reinhardt and Bob Keane, who have sort of ushered along. Since Fulfum 5 came out, uh, Larry Ganji has been our programmer. Roger Ottmeyer with the Ferrer Group and at PNW, he was, uh, has provided, of course, the FCCS fuel beds, but was also involved in the calibration of the burnout model. And it's just been, um, it's been a, useful, given us a lot of useful information for continuing development of FOFM, good ideas. I was involved in the post, some of the post-frontal combustion in work and in determining the bark thickness equations. And then Scott Mintzmoyer did a ton of work where he looked, um, did a, a literature search of all these uh, classes, fuels classes, to determine default fuel loads for the different classes that are used in full for a minute. I'll show you a little more about that in, in a minute. So this is, the, at this point, is the, uh, the end of the PowerPoint. Um, this is the web address for the Fire Lab Science applications. You can go there, find the download for FOFM. There's also a, uh, a couple of tutorials there. There's essentially this same PowerPoint. So if you want information, you can go there. Um, if you have specific information or questions, sorry, specific questions about FOFM, you can uh, send me an email or give me a call. So if there aren't any questions. Yeah, maybe uh, since there is sort of a natural break here, maybe uh, we, I'll unmute the line for a second and we can see if anybody has any questions at this point. So uh, if you're eating, eating loudly or, or having a background conversation, uh, you might want to put your own phone on pause, and I'll go ahead and unpause the main line. Okay. So if anybody wants to shout out a question, or if you're more comfortable typing it in the chat box, please feel free. We have a shy audience. <laughs> anyone, anyone? Okay, I guess we'll uh, we'll sort of move on then. Uh, I'll, uh, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, maybe I'll leave the line open here, and we can move on to the um, uh, the live demo. Okay. I see. Well, this always is a little bit tricky. Ah, but it looks like it's it's working. We're so, all good. All right. Um, most people may find that their screen is a is the it's a little bit hard to read. It's a little small. Um, but uh, hopefully, this, if you've used FOFM before, this will kind of remind you where things are. And if you hadn't, it will kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. You may not be able to read every line or every line of the output. Um, but uh, if you have questions, we may be able to zoom in on different parts. So uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Duncan. All right. Thank you. So I'll try not to make this too painful, but I do want to give enough information to folks so that they kind of understand at least the basis basics of how Fulfum is working. Um, at the, the top here, you know, I'm just going to go through all these different uh, parts of the data entry screen here. The first thing is the project menu where you just, you can open and save, um, make new projects. So any kind of project that you might want to save for later, you can do that here. Reports you can create, save and print reports. You can create, save and print graphs view to switch between the graphs and the reports. The option setting, there are a few options here. Um, some people just want to run the burnup model all by itself, so this is where you can do that. It'll, you can create a sample burnup file and then input that file into burnup and get the outputs. And that's 
it's kind of nice because there are a couple um, uh, constants, calibration constants that are used in burnup. And some people like to be able to modify those a little bit. There are also uh, some different ways that you can enter in essentially multitudes of fuel classes rather than just the one hour, 10 hour, and so on. And so this way, uh, using this burn up, run burn up from an input file, you can kind of accommodate some of that data better. You can also do the same thing for the soil temperature. You know, just it's the same information that's provided in a little more dense um, output file if you run the soil heating from this options menu. And then you can load that into uh, Excel or a spreadsheet, something like that. Then the last thing on this, this drop down is the batch processing, which again is really useful if you have a number of plots that you want to simulate fire effects for. The help I, I do want to point out, not that it's anything super special, but um, there's a part of it here that is really useful for uh, if, if you're running Fulfum and you just kind of wonder what's going on in the background. There's the scientific content section. And so for instance, if you're, you're looking at fuel consumption and you wonder, you know, what equations are used to predict dust consumption? Hey, um, Dan, or, let me break in for a second. For some yeah. reason, that new window uh, that popped up uh, isn't shown, and so we just get a black box. I don't know really? why. I, okay. So, All right. Then we, I won't I'll just close yeah. it out. <laughs> okay. So I will explain that the, the help does provide the scientific content if you want to know specifically what equation was used, every, everything that's calculated in a FOFM, when you see a report, it'll tell you what equations were used. You can go into that help file, look up the equation, and, and say, well, hey, that's sort of like what our you know, situation we have, or that's not anything like what we have. And then you can use that to balance um, the reality of some of the outputs that are coming from FOFM. There are radio buttons here for the four different uh, effects that we're simulating. The mortality window looks a little bit different than the fuel and the smoke and the soil. The only thing different from the soil is over on the right. We've got this soil drop-down box where you select your soil type and your soil moisture. Um, the next box over here at the top is uh, this is where you save your project file. And you'll notice that a lot of these boxes up in at the top especially don't have any uh, labels on them, which is another issue that I see with um, Fulfum, and so we're going to fix that in, in version 6. But if you type in these boxes or click into them, there's a description that's given right down here below that will tell you kind of what that box is for. So this is the path name of the project here. If I click in this one, I have the four regions where we have kind of divided the United States up into and then we assign appropriate equations for each one of those regions. And that will tell you down here in this menu bar also that it says select a geographic region. The next box is a little bit more involved. These are the classifications that are used to determine the default fuel beds that we use in FOFM. So we've got SAF and SRM, Society of American Foresters, Society of Range Management. And for each one of those, um, classes within that classification, we have default fuel loads for those fuel beds. And that comes from the work that uh, Scott Mintzmoyer did. He did the same thing for the National Vegetation Classification System. Um, the next one is FCCS, and that of course came from the Fire Lab at the uh, Seattle Fire Lab. And then the FLMs are the fuel loading models, and those are some, came from a publication that I did with Bob Keen, and uh, just a separate classification. Going down below, there are the four seasons uh, where you can simulate burn, spring, summer, fall, or winter. We don't really define those. It's up to you to decide. The next one is uh, the moisture regime, whether it's very dry, moderate, or wet. And when you select one of these, it automatically applies these default fuel moistures. So for the 10 hour, it's 10 percent fuel moisture. For the coarse wood debris, it's 50. For the duff, it's 40. If I change it, then those change to 16, 30, and 75. If I don't like those, I can go in and enter what I want. 
and um, it's just a modified fuel bed. For now, I'll switch it back to uh, the dry. The next one box here is the fuel type, natural fuel, pile fuel, or slash fuel. If you select pile fuel, you'll probably get a warning that says something about they haven't been completely integrated. And basically, for piled fuels, we use <clears throat> the natural fuel um, equations and that kind of thing. So I don't think that there's any point at this time to use the piled fuels. And either we're going to remove it in version 6 or we're going to fully implement that in version 6. Kind of halfway done now. Then um, based on this classification, and right now we got the SEF, SRM cover type classification, this box will provide a drop down of a number or all of the uh, different classes, SAF classes or SM, SRM classes, and provide default fuel loads for each of those. So in this one, I'm just going to select uh, SRM 109, Ponderosa Pine Shrublands. And when I do, I get default fuel loads in here for litter, for the one hour, 10 hour, 100 hour, and so on down the line. This whole row are the default fuel loads. So if I'm a manager and maybe I know what the fine woody debris, coarse woody debris is, I could select this SRM cover type and then enter in my own information if I have it. Or I can just, or I can just leave it um, at, at its typical value. The problem with the course applying or assigning fuel loads at, at, by vegetation is that fuel loads are highly variable within these vegetation classes. <clears throat> and that's because the classes don't do a good job of taking into account disturbance history, essentially. So we don't know if this is a ponderosa pine stand with, <clears throat> excuse me, that with fire exclusion, if it's had some blowdown in it, maybe it's been harvested, maybe it's had just, you know, it's been restored to a fire dependent system. We don't know. It's a little bit hokey, but in Fulfum you can select whether you want to go um, select light, which would be half of the load of the litter, or heavy, which would double the load of the litter. So maybe a manager doesn't really know exactly what the fuels are, but he can say, you know, it, there's more litter than 1.4 tons per acre. And so they can select one of those, uh, one of these options in the drop down to increase or decrease the fuel load as they like. Um, so that's that whole role where it says typical. If, if I type something in here, it'll change so that it says user, so it's user entered. And Xander, I think you're unmuted, or somebody's unmuted, just so you know. Um, the fuel moistures that I've already talked about, the next row down, this is the log rot. So now we're looking at the coarse weeded debris. We have five tons per acre, 15% moisture, 10% of the load is rotten because Rotten fuels consume different than sound fuels. And then we have this even right, left, and center distribution, which isn't all that intuitive. Um, if, if the fuels, uh, and this is only for the coarse weedy debris, if the large fuels greater than three inch are left, what we call a left distribution, that means that most of the biomass is in the three to nine inch class. If it's right dis distributed, then most of the fuels are in the 9-inch and greater class. If it's center distributed, it's between, it's, most of the biomass is between 9 and 20-inch. So again, going back to how burnup works, it's this interaction of the pieces, and the size of those pieces have different effects in terms of interaction and the ability to continue the combustion process. So this loading distribution helps, um, helps burn up burn those large woody fuels more appropriately. Again, you could get around using this if you wanted to go to that options menu, run burn up by itself. You could get rid of using this distribution because once you use that, you can make any distribution you want. The next boxes I'm looking down here in the duff column, we have five tons per acre of the duff, 40% moisture. And then we have six tenths uh, of an inch of duff Again, duff is important for soil heating, so we need to know how much depth there is of the duff. The load is important, important for emissions, so we need to know how much load. So that's why we have both the load and the depth of the duff. The next box down is 
the def, sorry, the duff moisture uh, method that it's measured, whether it's the entire in places where there's deep duff, sometimes they only look at the lower duff moisture, and then there are a couple of fire danger rating options there for, or for entering your duff moisture. Crown burned is simply how much crown you think is going to be burned, and that's just percent total, so not scorch height, percent total. And then we take that value and we calculate the emissions based on um, how much of the foliage and branch wood would, would, would be consumed. All right, that's a, I think enough of that. I just want to do, um, I'm going to do a couple reports here and just talk about them pretty briefly, and then there's one other thing I wanted to show. Uh, so we're going to do a uh, fuel consumption report. The report header will give us enough information that we could probably, or that we can do this. It was an interior west. This was the cover type, SRM 109, ponderosa pine shrublands. It was a natural fuel type. And over here are all the moistures that were used for each component. So if you don't use one of these uh, default moisture regimes, it'll actually report what you entered in the box here for your moistures. We have pre-burn load in the first column, consumed, and then post-burn load, and percent reduced for each fuel component down below, so starting with the litter all the way down to the crown of branch wood. It also produces this equation number, as I said before, so if you want to go back and see what equation it was, um, 999 means it was done in the burnout model. It was calculated in the burnout model. So litter and all of the windy material are all modeled in the burnout model. Duff equation 2 is what was used, so you can go look that up if you want. Overall, to begin with, we had just over 20 tons per acre. After the burn, we had almost 13 tons per acre, so we had 36 tons per acre. No, I'm sorry, 36% reduction in fuels post-fire. Down below, we have just a little bit more information about the forest fuel component, components duff depth consumed with six-tenths of an inch. And remember, we had six-tenths to start with, so we had complete duff reduction in this case. And then mineral soil exposure of about 51%. So if you were a manager and you said, you know, I, I'm worried about complete duff consumption, I want to... Um, try a different moisture regime, we could do that. So now I've selected the moderate moisture regime. I just go up and I create another report, and the report follows, immediately follows in this report window, the one that was right above. So everything above that line is the first report with, at the dry moisture regime, and everything below here now is at the moderate moisture regime. And in this case, we have about 31% uh, consumption of the fuels versus 36 percent the first time. And in this case, or in this simulation, we consumed only four-tenths of an inch of duff. So that means that there's some duff remaining. Remembering back to how important duff is as uh, being an insulator versus uh, a source of heating to the soil, we can run a soil heating model to see what difference that uh, keeping that duff on site makes to the soil heating, for instance. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to select dry. I'm going to select the soil, heat, the soil heating module. I'm going to leave the soil type as coarse silt, the moisture at 10. And then I'm just going to create a graph, accept those defaults. And in this graph, um, and I'm not sure if you folks can see the color, but there, there's an invisible line here at 60 that um, everything above is red. So what we see is that this is the soil surface over 250 degrees C at the soil surface, one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. All the way down to seven centimeters, um, we have soil heating greater than 60 degrees C. I'll just uh, leave that discussion there, redo the same, uh, the same soil heating simulation, except change it to the moderate for, um, soil moisture, create the graph, accept the defaults, and you can see just by changing the moisture, we have duff that's remaining now, and we've reduced a lot of the soil heating. We could conceivably maybe modify just the duff moisture. Um, we set, instead of at 75, we set it at 40, 
and this will be uh, just a guess. I have no idea how much soil heating we'll see. But here we see increased uh, soil heating just because the duff is now at 40% moisture, so the more of it is being consumed. We can change it to 30. This is just out of my own curiosity. Um, it stays about the same. So at this point, this is probably the heat going into the soil is not only the, the heat from the surface fire, but also um, the heat from the burning duff. I'm going to do uh, just a quick mortality simulation just so you can see it. Um, in this case, I just, I've just entered some trees. We've got two, two sets of trees for uh, three species types. Ponderosa pine, 4-inch, Ponderosa pine, 8-inch, lodgepole, 4-inch, lodgepole, 8-inch, and then a spruce, 4-inch and 8-inch. I'll set my scorch height at 10 feet and do a simulation, create this report. This report will show us the original stand density. Again, we have our 60 trees, 30 in the 4-inch class, 30 in the 8-inch class. Those are our species, so we have three species there. I skipped over the trees uh, in the post-fire stand density, looking at trees killed by the fire. We can see that we have two ponderosa pine trees killed by that fire total, one in each class, and a total of 12 Engelmann spruce killed. So there is some species-specific uh, modification to mortality based on because of the bark thickness in this case. The next table is the probability of mortality. In this case, uh, even though we predicted that one, one out of 10 trees would die, the actual probability was 6%. So, um, yeah, 6 out of 100. The equation number that was used is nine, 19. For the lodgepole pine, we have 35 and 30%. For the Engelmann spruce, we have 65 and 52%. So you can see, again, the species species related differences um, in mortality. This table is just uh, different scorch heights. If you wanted to look at mortality, I'm not going to really go into it. At the bottom, it'll show us that our percent mortality was 32 percent. Um, it'll tell us the number of trees killed by the fire and then our change in, in basal area down in this area and the change in canopy cover down here. And of course, we hardly had any trees, so we didn't have much canopy cover to begin with, but we reduced it by 3% in this particular instance. So unless um, somebody wants to see a specific simulation, I think that that's all I want to look at here. I just wanted to go over a couple other things about the model in a separate, uh, separate document. So Xander, I don't know if you're seeing anybody asking questions or having any requests? Well, yeah, one, one question came in in the chat window that you can read from Dave uh, Passavoy about uh, modifying the fuel moisture. And if you do so, does it matter what season you've, you've put in? Yeah, um, that's a, a good question. There is an interrelationship between season um, and region and fuel type, and then um, and the moisture. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that you could do a spring burn and a summer burn, um, and then you could do a spring burn but set your moistures at what you would see maybe in the spring, and you're going to get different estimates because we use that season to um, select an equation. So if you're burning in the summer, you know, it's best to select that season as the summer. If you're burning in the spring, it's best to select the season as the spring and not just depend on the moisture to select the correct equation because moisture isn't, moist, percent moisture isn't used to select the equation for the consumption. I hope that was clear enough. Dave, if, if you, uh, you're unmuted, so you can uh, follow up on your question if, if you want to. No, that was clear. Um, and then next to the season, there's a box that says moderate. Yep. That, that's to the, yeah, to the right. If you, 
it doesn't matter if you change those and then mess around with customizing your moisture levels, will it also be different? I mean, no. Okay. Um, so so the, these, are, these are just a convenient way to set all of those moistures at once. So they're all set to some, you know, dry moisture regime, all set to moderate. Then if you go and you change those, it doesn't, um, it's, it's not changing the way that the model is selecting the equations. It's just changing those as inputs to the equations in the model. I hope, does that make sense? You're right. So you can almost ignore that. Yes. You can ignore that if you want to customize your moistures. Absolutely. Yep. You could go in here. I, I could set this to wet and set all of these, you know, to some unbelievably low level. Right. And it's going to use that unbelievably low level. Great. So, yep, you can just modify those moistures as you want. Great. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Xander, I don't see the chat window, so I'm not sure if there are any other questions. Oh, sorry. No, there, um, there are no, no other questions right now. Anybody else um, want to speak up and, and verbally ask a question right now? Okay, I guess Duncan, okay. you can uh, continue on then to another. If you want, you mentioned sure. you wanted another run. I do, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. Let me share. Okay. When it comes up, hopefully you can see this word document. Coming. Okay. Hey, there? yeah, there it is. Okay. So the, the big question, you know, that comes up when you use any of these models is how good are they? And that's a really a excellent question to ask. And so I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, one is that the, the burn-up model was developed from real data, you know, or I should say it was calibrated from real data. It's a mechanistic model, but it was calibrated with, with real data. And so I wanted to show this graph, show 68 burns and how the model is fit to that data. And this is, you know, we're fitting the model to the data that created it. So you expect to see a fairly good relationship, and we do see a fairly good relationship. But the important thing to look at here is that, and this is in kilograms per square meter, the lowest level here is about one kilogram per square meter, somewhere around five tons per acre. So the range of this study was, had five tons, sorry, five tons per acre to about 50 tons per acre of large woody fuel, and that was how burn-up was calibrated. So I wanted to show that just so you can see that burn-up does work in some cases. And now this was a study that was done um, the folks are here at the fire lab in Missoula and the fire lab uh, in Seattle at the fair group, they did a validation of fuel consumption models, and this is for smoke management, and specifically for fuels in the east and, and uh, in the southeast. And the red dots here are consume, the black dots are both of them, and my interest isn't to compare the two models. Um, my interest is really just to show you how well or how poorly, depending on how you look at it, the model is predicting. Uh, fire effects. In this case, this is just um, woody fuel consumption, or I'm not, I'm sorry, not woody fuel consumption, total consumption. So here we have this total consumption box. Um, we have some outliers, but it is interesting to me that this relationship tends to get better as you see more fuel with this one exception up here in the upper right. But as fuel load gets up, goes higher, then the relationship um, between our ability to accurately predict consumption seems to improve. And I think that's because, you know, when we don't have much fuel, um, we tend to have, you know, kind of patchy fires and that kind of thing. And so that's just a theory. I have no idea. I should also state that this black line in the middle is the one-to-one -one line. What you want to see is all those dots, of course, going right up the one-to-one -one line. So in this case, you can see that both models are doing okay, not great, They're doing better as you get more fuel, so on. Shrubs, the next, next one to the right, it's a little bit better. The herbs, remarkably good, especially when um, you know what equation is being used to predict the consumption of herbs. Down woody fuel as a whole, they're doing okay. Some over prediction there. Um, 
But when we get down here to the coarse weighted debris, you can see in this, this graph, the fuel greater than the 1,000 hour, there's burn up is having a real problem down here. And that the, they were measuring up to three tons per acre of, of consumption, but we're predicting hardly any, if any, consumption of those fuels. Consume, and just so people know what happened was that we, we ran this, um, we did this compare comparison, the folks that ran consume recognized that there were some problems at the beginning. Um, so they modified the equations so that to improve the model, which is what we should be doing. You know, the models don't work, we should constantly be improving them. So they took the equations, um, put them in to consume so that it's in the current version of consume, and now it's doing a great job of predicting woody fuel consumption. That's what you'd want to see, something right up the line. Burnup isn't doing such a good job. And so that's another thing that I wanted to talk about for the next version of FOFM is that in version six, we want to improve. We're going to look at this consumption, of course, weeded debris. Um, we're going to maybe look at the consumption of the litter because that's not, we're not doing a very good job with that either, and try to improve the model. But overall, the models um, do a decent job of predicting at least fuel consumption and then supposedly um, emissions because they're so closely tied to each other. So that is it. I think I think I've used up my hour unless there are other questions. Yeah, we 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 don't have to end exactly on time. Um, I thank you everybody for participating, and uh, feel free to hang around if you have questions. Um, you can just unmute your line and um, and shout them out or or type them in the chat box. And uh, in, a, in a minute or two, when we shut down the webinar, you'll be uh, sent to a survey on the webinar so that we can try to improve this series. Um, and I'll also follow up with an email with a link to the uh, recording of this if you want uh, to share it with anybody else or, or touch back on it for reference. Any other questions or comments out there? Okay. Uh, someone just typed in the chat box. They're looking forward to full from six. So that's <laughs> about your your big enthusiasm. All right. Well, Duncan, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. And uh, for somebody like me who who's not yet a Fofum user, really sort of highlighted uh, some of the advantages of using Fofum. So um, I think uh, you, you did a great job, kind of walking through both the um, uh, philosophy behind it and some of the inner workings, as well as actually how to use it once I download it. So thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to uh, shut things down. So thanks, everybody, for participating. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, having you join on future webinars. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>